everybody, and welcome to Lights, Camera, Exploitation, your guide to exploitive cinema. This is your host with the motherfucking most, TJ Bowser, and joining me as always is my doppelganger, Kanga Banga, from down under, Mr. Brody Kane. Konnichiwa, bitches. And Mr. Slick Nick himself. Oh, Bello, once more. We got a doozy of an episode for you today, but first, you know what time it is. It's time for your slice of life. Brody, tell us how your week was. It's been not too shabby at all, Mr. Bowser. Um, yeah, like I say every week, fucking flat out at work. Um, oh, my fucking diabolic Blu-rays have finally shipped out, which is my mother of tears and snake eater Blu-ray. So I'm really, really excited for them honky tonks. Um, also received this week uh, the Changeling Blu-ray from Severin Films. Mm. Very, very delicious slip cover. It's all raised lettering. Metallic. Even the wheelchair on it. Yes. Yes. Very shiny, glossy blue. Looks nice. fucking exquisite. Um, the Gates of Hell from Dark Force Superstore. Even that's raised. The, wow, um, gorgeous. I don't know if you've seen the poster, but anyway, yeah, the zombie heads all glow in the dark and the font. Very, very nice. Oh, indeed. nice. And that uh, Robocop director's cut from our lovely Arrow films. I'm still yet to watch it because I'm trying to catch up on everything else, but I can't wait to see that. And a very underrated horror film to which we will be covering this season, and that is Lake Mungo from Second Sight Films. What a delicious package that was. It comes with a shit ton of special features, like rare interviews with the cinematographer, um, the making of pretty much. And um, inside, we get a booklet that's about 50 pages long and yeah. also some artwork, gift cards. So, yes, it's um, very oh, – it looks great on the screen. Um, I didn't. I don't think that it was a 4K. I can't really remember, but, yeah, in saying that – Delicious stuff right there. But other than that, yeah, no, just moping around, watch this fantastic movie, and, uh, yeah, pretty keen to dive in today and uh, review it. How about you, Slick Nick? How's your week? Not too bad. Uh, work's been all right. Um, my nerdy ass has been replaying the old Dragon Age games because apparently I'm on a Bioware kick, so that's pretty much all I've done with my free time aside from, well, recording shows. Um, yeah, I mean, that's really been mostly about it. Uh, I'd be buying some physical copies of some stuff too, as well, if it wasn't for, uh, and if anyone's listened to Beetle Bros at all, they already know, but the uh, trip that we're all taking next month. So pretty much every scrap of pennies being saved towards that for right now, <laughs> I've still got to buy my sleeping bag. Uh, still not bad though. Um, mostly just been kind of hanging around, uh, trying to stay out of the heat. Midwest has been gross. <laughs> this whole week and finally it all just broke literally today right before we started recording and i got absolutely soaked on my way home because it's just destroyed raining but really uh that's i mean about been about it mostly been kind of a little boring around here but i'll take that over uh, bad any day what about you tj what you've been up to well, I'm finally back from my little film trip. Uh, we got a lot done. Brody and I made a lot of headway, kind of uh, figured out what we're doing with our little short that we are doing. Oh, we're talking about it freely now. Anyway, uh, yeah, waiting on my orders from Diabolic DVD, waiting on my order from Vinegar Syndrome. When those arrive, I'll let you guys know that stuff's going to be too. Sweet. Watched a bunch of film today, as I always do. Uh, talked to Brody today, as I always do. And kind of worked on some more Project Louder stuff since I got home, trying to catch back up with everything. I was gone for a week, hence why our absence from uh, releasing this episode uh, last week. But hey, is what it is. But we are back in full force and to bring you another glorious episode of your favorite podcast. But yeah, guys, thank you for supporting this show. Thank you for all the listeners last month and especially a big thank you to the Swiss. Thank Thank you for <laughs> putting us in your top 100 on iTunes and keeping us there for the better part of two weeks. Uh, it means the world, and we will indulge in Swiss cheese this week because we don't know anything else. Excuse us as we talk about 1990s King of New York. New York. The streets are dangerous. The deals are dirty. The people are deadly. From here on, nothing goes down unless I'm involved. You know what you're up to, White. Forget it. But only this man can be king. You expected to get away with killing all these people? The king of New York. I never killed anybody that didn't deserve it. Starts Friday at a famous player's theater near you.
And that is from director Abel Ferrara, who also did The Driller Killer in 1979, Bad Lieutenant in 1992, New Rose Hotel from 1998, which I watched earlier, and Mary from 2005. Writers Nicholas St. John, who also wrote with Ferrara Nine Lives of a Wet Pussy in 1976, Birdie likes that, Fear City in 1984, China Girl in 1987, and Body Snatchers in 1993. Cinematographer Bojan Bazali, who also did Pumpkinhead in 1988, Deep Cover in 1992, The Lone Ranger in 2013, and Snake Eyes in 2021, and music by Joe Delia, who also did Cage Fury in 1990, Twilight Highway in 1995, and The Substitute 2, Schools Out in 1998, and National Lampoon's Dirty Movie in 2011. Producers, Vittorio Squalante and Mary Kane, budget $5 million, starring Christopher Watch Where You're Walking as Frank White, who also did The Deer Hunter in 1978, The Dead Zone in 1983, and Kangaroo Jack in 2003. David Caruso is Detective Dennis Gilly, who also did Getting Wasted in 1980, Twins in 1988, that's a fucking classic, and Black Point in 2001. Larry Fishburne as Jimmy Jump Colt, who also did Apocalypse Now in 1979, A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Keep Warriors in 1987, and The Matrix in 1999. Victor Argo as Lieutenant Roy Bishop, who also did Dealing in 1972, Taxi Driver in 1976, Monkey Trouble in 1994. Wesley Snipes is Detective Tommy Flanagan, Major League in 1989, Demolition Man in 1993, and Blade in 1998. Janet Julian as Jennifer, Big Wednesday in 1978, Humongous in 1982, and Heaven is a Playground in 1991. Paul Cauldron as Joey DeLazio, who also did Tenement in 1985, Pulp Fiction 1994, M. Copland in 1997. C. Buscemi as Test Tube, who also was in Vibes in 1988, the classic Airheads in 1994, and Youth and Revolt in 2009. That film's awesome. Check it out. And lastly, Giancarlo Esposito as Lance, who was also in the aforementioned Changeling from 1980, Maximum Overdrive in 1986, and Monkey Bone from 2001. Baroda Kane, take it away. After completing a lengthy prison sentence, one-time drug kingpin Frank White returns to New York, intent on re-establishing his empire and making things as they were before he left. Others, of course, have taken over the business during his absence, but that clearly isn't going to stop White. While he's gunning down the opposition, he decides he's going to give away the money he'll make to modernize the hospital in his old neighborhood. Drug dealers aren't the only thing he has to worry about, however... A group of road cops decide they are going to take him down. This film won a couple of awards, and those would be the Film Independent Spirit Awards in 1991, Best Cinematography, Bojan Bazelli nominee, Mistfest in 1991, Best Direction, Abel Ferrara winner, Winner Chicken Dinner, Best Film, Abel Ferrara nominee. Well, boys, it's been a while, but you know what time it is, Brody? Let's get physical. <laughs> Okay, so this week's film has got a release from Arrow Video from November 16th, 2020, and it features a lovely new 4K restoration from the original negative by Arrow Films, approved by director Bel Ferrara and cinematographer Bojan Bazzetti. High definition Blu-ray 1080p tr- presentation on your normal release of that, not the 4K one, an LPCM original stereo and remix DTS HD MA 5.1 surround audio options. Optional English subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing and for those who have kids. An audio commentary by director Abel Ferrara and another audio commentary by composer Joe Delia. Producer Mary Kane, which is not Brody's mom. Casting director Sandy Sabwasa and editor Anthony Redman. Interview with director Abel Ferrara, an interview with producer Augusto Camito. Abel Ferrara, not guilty, a documentary on the director from the French TV show Cinestes de Notre Temps, a short film about the long career of Abel Ferrara, a documentary looking back at the director's career, including interviews with his key collaborators, original theatrical trailers and TV spots, image gallery, reversible sleeve, featured newly commissioned artwork by Tracy Ching. This particular release is region B locked. It also has a UHD 4K that's also available, and it's currently on Arrow Films for 18 pounds. Probably about $25 American, I think. Something like that. So, boys, lay it on it thick with that additional information. All right. In an interview with Abel Ferrara, film historian Nicole 
Brenner's asked Ferrara about where the idea for the King of New York came from. Ferrara replied, I had seen the Terminator and remember watching it thinking, okay, is this what everybody wants? Is this the big deal? I look back at it now and I think it's a great movie, but I wanted to get into that groove of making a film based on that and what I had preserved as an audience reaction. So I started writing a couple of pages, gave it to the screenwriter, Nicholas St. John, and he started dealing with it. We would then get into these deals in Hollywood at the time and people paid for it. But the bottom line is that we worked on this script for a very long time. It was first called Murder One and then it started to be about the cop and criminals. Before I start mine really quick, can I just say I appreciate that we credited Pulp Fiction to Paul Calderon and not Christopher Walken. We gave him Kangaroo Jack, and I just wanted to say I loved that. <laughs> I put the money in the jacket, and the jacket on the kangaroo, and now he hopping away. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Jimmy Jump uh, was actually originally to be played by actor James Russo, uh, but Abel Ferrari ended up casting Lawrence Fishburne, Larry, for the role simply because when he appeared for his audition, he came in in the costume as was seen in the film and they loved his appearance for it so much that they gave him the role anyway. Hell yeah! <laughs> I love it. When asked if the film is uh, based on the matter of the struggle between the wealthy and the poor, Ferrara quote, the King of New York is really about the working class of the cops versus the newfound drug dealers who flaunt their bullshit money that they have. The film did initially suffer some backlash from the subject matter, with the premiere at the New York Film Festival having several walkouts, including director Abel Ferreira's own wife, who told him, this is awful, you're at least going to give the proceeds to a drug rehabilitation center, right? <laughs> Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Having the budget being five to six million dollars, Ferrara states we went to Italy and had lunch. Then somebody gave us a check for five million. Can you imagine that? Okay, those days are over. Forget about it. It ain't happening ever again. I'll actually come back to that as well here in a minute. Uh, so, actor David Caruso actually was the one who petitioned for Wesley Snipes to appear in the film as they had been working together on a TV show that never did fully materialize. Snipes at the time was reportedly living out of his car, though their appearances in the film worked out well for both of them as they went on to be cast in NYPD uh, Blue and New Jack City, respectively, which launched their careers. When asked about describing Christopher Walken's character, Frank White, in the film, Ferrara simply states, the guy's a stone-cold killer. Sure, you can have all of these reasons and a rationale, but really, where's the bottom line? If you take that film as realistic, how realistic can you take the film? I mean, you don't take over the drug trade in three days. You don't come out of jail and take over the Italian mob. So the metaphor for a guy with what he tried to do with a vision, who was saying, okay, my money is going to pull people together and be a socialist mob. But basically the guy's a dreamer and he knows that he has little time left. An extremely compilated character. Uh, Lucille M. Oliver, uh, who, spoiler alert, plays Frank's hostage on the subway nearing the end of the film, had actually never acted before uh, in this movie, uh, until she appeared in the movie. Walken apparently prepared her for the scene by telling her, I'm going to do something awful to you but I will not hurt you. She did later go on to appear in such films as Primal Fear, Showtime, The Rules of Attraction, and even Minority Report. Rara talks about uh, Christopher Walken being involved with the film. In my mind, he was like a hero to us. So Nicholas St. John and I were waiting for him in his house to which he came home, and we were ready to give him this incredibly big speech. In walks Christopher. He looked at me and Nikki and said, hey, I know what you want, and I can give it to you. And then he left. That was it. And I remember saying, well, that was a great meeting, man. I honestly thought he would have to, well, we would have to talk to him into it because with Chris, never ever plan how a conversation is going to go when he's around. However, he was fantastic to work with. The thing is that he would do all these different takes, like one which we called the fake out Pacino. And he would do this as a warm up. Now that involved was the screaming, yelling and acting crazy. I would show him these takes and his response was, are you crazy? You're not supposed to use these. These are just stuff to warm up to. You're crazy, man. One of the things I found, the film in its original form was about two hours long and was actually 
set to receive an X rating uh, due in part to the initial backlash. This was dropped to an R rating only after nearly an entire hour, about 50 minutes or so, ended up being cut from the film. At least that direct is cut. See, I want it because it's going to be like twice as long and it's got to have so much more awesome stuff. Release the That's Ferrara cool. cut! Give us the Ferrara cut! <laughs> <laughs> That's what we need! We got to hashtag it though. Hashtag release it was the, the Ferrara only way. Cut. So, Ferrara uh, talking about the cinematography, uh, cinematography in the film. It takes a lot of time, a lot of people, and a lot of money to light some scenes. When you bring lights in and diffusion in front of them, it's like a big deal. We took a long time to shoot this film. The shots were all set up, but I got bored with all of that stuff. I'm sure it has a place, but it is a real jerk off in a certain sense. Did we get that? Did we get to the heart and core of all that stuff? Did we take it beyond unfamiliar territory and it isn't scripted? I wasn't ready to do it as a director. I really didn't have the nerve to do it. So by hiding my fear with these wonderful shots, I'm consistently comparing them to other movies in Hollywood today. I'll see a film and be like, oh, Hey, that looks great. What is really behind all that? What is really the essence of that? I think my next one actually kind of adds on to it. Uh, I kind of wanted to point out. Sometimes you just got to appreciate a shot. It doesn't have to be oh, a fucking oh, point fuck. behind everything. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know the meaning for it. If it's just a pretty shot. Fuck, man, it's just a pretty shot. <laughs> kind of reminds me of that whole uh, English teacher in school. This is a representation of, you know, how the author was feeling and the author's intentions were the curtains were fucking blue, real dude. Real question. I, <laughs> the real question is why does Wesley Snipes make fun of Lawrence Fishburne's character for eating chicken? That's the real question. <laughs> you want to talk about straight dialogue, but continue. Part of me, part of me almost feels like West, knowing now what we know about Wesley Snipes, he may have just like had a problem with Larry on set. <laughs> you chicken eating piece of shit. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, so kind of in addition to that, the the just I wanted to point out the staggering amount of work that got put into this film, and it kind of shows through a few things that I found the the five year process that Abel Ferrara and Nicholas St. John went through in constructing this script. It left very little opportunity for improvisation on set, so there is not a lot of it. Almost every single word they say is in the script. But just the fact that they went through five years just to get the script together for this, and then all the work of after they got it. Consider So the final car chase scene where they're just kind of driving around, it's after the Queensboro Bridge one, um, which they did actually shut the Queen Bur Queensboro Bridge down for a few nights to record that, which is fucking insane to me that they could even do that in 1990. But the the scene where they're all driving around, that is a set. That is a warehouse set that they constructed within a warehouse that they had them drive around wow. and just piece for piece put that thing together. It gets more insane than that. The beginning scene where we see Frank White taking a shower when he first gets home, that's not just an apartment, that's not just, that is a fully constructed set piece that they made of a bathroom and shower on a rooftop of a New York City building that they shot all of that within because they were already on site and just built the thing to shoot the set in it instead of getting an apartment or anything like that to shoot it. They put blood, sweat, and tears into this fucking thing, and it shows. Nice. Seriously. Reading it, I was just like, there's no way they spent the time and money to <laughs> make a fake shower to put on a rooftop just to video Christopher walking, washing his hair. You're kidding. <laughs> so uh, basically, Ferrara talking about collaborating with uh, the mu or oh, collaborating about the music with Joe Delia. We really did some cool work by using the subway to which we were programming the effects of the confrontation of the subway being scored. We switched off, and it was going to be more of a uh, trumpety jazzy score, which Nicholas St. John hated. So we changed that. But I kind of like that though. There is that long uh, shot. Uh, from the point of view of someone sitting on a train. And that basically shows you the score of that scene. I really like how that plays out. Just gives it that more realistic um, element to it. Gotcha. So, yeah, no, I, I actually really like that one too. I always love when they do a shit like a city establishment shot and it's, you know, that POV from just like the train or anything. Like it, It's always great, especially whenever the music's really good for it too. Um, so 
According to Ferrara, uh, former President Donald Trump actually at the time gave him permission to film at the Plaza Hotel at no charge on the condition that Christopher Walken would pose for a photograph with Ivana Trump, who was a major fan of the actor at the time. They look great. They look so good and so beautiful. Oh, God. I, I, looked and I was like, TJ's typing into the thing. Motherfucker. <laughs> Ferrara talking about the realization and success of the film um, basically states that the film was not a big hit and they did not want to sell it as a gangster movie because there was this racist attitude and black kids were going to tear up the cinemas, especially being a black gang movie at the time. It was all this racist bullshit. So really, the film should have been sold for what it was. It was a violent gang movie with a black hip-hop soundtrack. But over the years, it's become more of a film that people don't really shut up about. Man, that's fair. I can almost get it. Kind of adding on to that. I didn't actually have it in my notes, but um, Biggie Smalls, uh, was actually a really big fan of this movie. And for a lot of his music, he released it under the moniker Frank White. Yeah, I, I, that... I noticed that one in the there. I actually knew that was a fan of his. To ever exist. Biggie Small. Fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> I'm a huge fan. I, just, I actually just knew that one. Um, but yeah. Uh, so the calling back earlier to when he said that someone cut us a check for $5 million, the film was partially financed by the richest man in Italy at the time, Silvio Berlusconi, Whoa. who provided funding through several intermediaries, including New York-based attorney and producer Jay Julian, who has also represented actors Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, and Harvey Keitel, who's also worked with Abel. Jay also does make a small cameo appearance in the film as well. Ah. Was not able to find it. None of the things that I could find about that said what his character was. So it was just looking through a sea of faces in New York City and going... One of these is an attorney, <laughs> which it's New York. So 75% of these people are attorneys. <laughs> so uh, Ferrara's final thoughts on the film, he quotes, it's not all about destruction. The point of the film is that you have to self-destruct to reinvent and recreate yourself to rise above it all. I like that. Yeah, too. It's nice. Um, and just to close it out, I suppose the final one that I had um, was just kind of about the production. Uh, so the production of this one was actually relatively smooth. Uh, the crew never actually had to spend more than one day at each filming location uh, throughout the city. They did film on site in New York City. Uh, the overall filming process ended up being wrapped up in just 40 days, which thinking back to the fact that they shut down the Queensboro Bridge to film, that they didn't have to spend more than one day doing that is fucking nuts. Like, that's actually insane to me. So that bridge, is that like the main bridge of New York? Or one of them. It's, a fucking clue it is. Uh, it's the main bridge between, I believe, Manhattan and the entirety of Queens, like the whole borough of Queens. Um, yeah, it's one of the oldest and most like important bridges in New York City. Like the fact that they shut that down, period, is nuts. <laughs> it's it's pretty it's pretty much like the iconic uh, bridge in like a lot of gangster movies, like Once Upon a Time in America. I think it's on the front cover. Is mm -hmm. that the one? I think yeah. so. I'm pretty sure it's probably one of the most iconic bridges in New York at yep. at the very least. Um, but yeah, it's definitely one of the most well known for a reason. Fucking a. Mm -hmm. Okay, boys. So if that's all you guys have, let's talk about it. Okay, favorite performance of the film. Christopher Walken, hands down. Okay, now oh, I will so say, cold. Christopher Walken with a special nod to Larry Fishburne, only because that character is so fucking cool, and I just Jimmy love him. He's so over the top with everything, and it's, it's it, and I love over the top characters and the way he goes out, fucking like a nutcase. I love like the whole laughing, literally thing. with a bang too. He's almost like a super villain. Like a Batman villain, and it, and I think that's Kinda. that's what I like about him so much. But going back to the Christopher Walken thing, he's so cold. He's so cold at times. But then also at the same time, Abel has this way of like, hey, but he's doing this and he's helping people. We're gonna flash back to violence, and then he's helping people. And I think it, it creates this balance throughout the film that makes you root for him, but also hate him at the same time. So Christopher Walken just does such a fantastic job, and especially seeing his other work with Abel, it's it's definitely dynamic so 
this character in particular, I think, just stands out so well. Absolutely. Um, he he's very unpredictable throughout um, each scene. You know, whether it's his mannerisms, uh, you know, I guess you could say body posture, even his facial expressions, and it's the way he comes across. And you, you you're not going to know how to take him. And but what? Yeah, I really like his. Um, he gets out of prison. He's happy to see everyone. And by the end of the film, he's a stone cold fucking killer. I mean that scene which I will elaborate on later at the funeral holy fuck did that caught me off guard but yeah you know um Abel Ferrari is um all about that character development and I think he fucking hit a home run with uh Hawkins character hands down and Larry Fishburns he was coming in at a close second for me uh close first for me fuck. oh yeah no, I, was, I was about to say uh I actually had just slightly the opposite it may just be because I have a bias towards Lawrence Fishburne. I love Lawrence Fishburne and everything, especially when he's playing over the top characters. My favorite was probably Jimmy Jump because he does, like TJ said, have that over the top, almost comic book villain. He's like the Riddler-esque and especially, yeah, his his death scene um, is just insanity, like purely just him riddled with bullets, just laughing like it's the funniest thing he's ever seen, even though he knows exactly what's about to happen to him. And he's just like, well, I may as well just go out as insane as I've been this entire movie the whole time. But yeah, I do have to agree with the character of Frank White. The fact that he's so complex, he's doing awful, terrible things, uh, but he's doing them for, you know, admittedly a good cause. You know, he's right. renovating a hospital and all of that. He's almost got, and because of how, like, everyone likes him, I kind of feel like he's almost got this sort of modern Al Capone kind of feel to him. Okay. How, like, and this and this is, like, not even movie That's stuff. This analogy. is just actual. That's about to, yeah, like, it's, and it's not even in movies. Like, he legitimately did this in real life. Al Capone would speak with the press about his moonshining businesses and talk about how he was building the city up and everything from it. And the government was dumb for outlawing alcohol and the prohibition. They were, but it was literally just, even though everyone knows he's orchestrating, you know, like the Valentine's day massacre, he's having people lined up and shot in the street and things like that. People still liked him because he was a public face. He was a warm personality. He could talk to you as a person and you would think he's this warm guy. And meanwhile, in the background, he finds out two guys are plotting behind his back and he's beating him to death with a baseball bat at like a dinner. Like, it's just this brutal under the surface, nice guy to your face. And yet at the end, they're still doing good stuff, but equally shitty things. And I just, I, I don't know. That's kind of what I got out of Frank's character. Really liked it really liked it okay favorite set piece boys the beautifully lit interior of the hotel that frank's staying at i thought that was that looked fucking fantastic i mean bit of tungsten lighting behind the characters you know it makes them really pop yeah but the production design you know the that that big open space filled with rich aesthetics and uh it just looks beautiful on screen um a nice and cozy rich man's uh drug palace i thought that was pretty cool and to see like jimmy and the boys rock up there it's like yeah it looks so out of ca- like out of place <laughs> there but they fit there as well it's just so fucking i don't know how that dynamic plays off when we see it looks i like it's just kind of like because they're part of frank's family almost like he like he likes them so much because he i mean he's ride or die with them for like the whole movie like i almost kind of felt like because it does happen in some where you get sort of the like big boss of the gang treats their underlings as expendable and he never does which i think also adds into the character like we were talking about but like they, it, it makes them feel like they're supposed to be there because he's in charge and to him they are supposed to be there they're his people um yeah no i mean that's a really good one i think i had i had the nightclub where the final shootout took place boom i really liked it so just grungy, down to earth, underbelly of New York paint, graffiti on every wall. But here we have Frank, a self made drug kingpin millionaire, hanging out doing coke with his buddies when the, you know, when the, the fight just comes through and everything. I just, it, I don't know, it was so perfectly placed. And it was such a good contrast to the upscale, you know, beautiful uptown New York hotel where he's been staying for most of the whole movie. When we get to the real nitty gritty of it, he's just caught in a seedy little underbelly nightclub. I completely agree with Nick. I think. 
think that is a fantastic set piece as well. I love how it's shot. I love how it is lit. I think that it's a it's a set that matches the tone of the scene that takes place inside of it so fucking well because nothing good happens in there. It's all it's all, it's all bad, and it, it's 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 a scene of betrayal and deception. It's it, it's it's a very intense scene, and I and I love it, and I love that that set. It's it's really rad. So moving on. So that kind of ties in with what I just said. Favorite scene slash shot. I will start it off by just going on with what I was saying before. But that that whole shootout in the uh, the nightclub is just too damn cool to dismiss. And I love how the violence is shot in there. You, we, we see all these characters that we got introduced over the last hour and a half slowly get killed off in front of us. It's it's, in, it's interesting. It's a powerful scene. And yeah, guys, it's yeah. I mean, it's almost a little bit hard to watch. I think yeah. did Lance, did Giancarlo Esposito's character survive? I couldn't honestly quite tell. And I don't think we I see him after somebody that in the scene. basement, wasn't he? Wasn't he one of the guys in the basement? Could he have been? No. He may have, well, I don't know, say if he was, he would have been in the scene where they determine the rat, where Frank takes care of the rat later. True that. Um, I think so. I loved I'm how that sure. was shot, by the way. I love like the shot down the oh. steps. So cool. Yes. Wait, Frank had every bit of power over him all, with it. Okay, from just also the think about it. Like what, and the blocking. Okay, since oh. we know how Abel Frarth works, think of why he did that. It's because Frank's always looking down on the people that betrayed him. So he's looking down on mm. him the entire time, and the camera is as well. So because we know how Abel Frarth works and the reasons why he actually has reasons why he puts places, cameras places, that makes sense. So interpret oh, yeah. that. <laughs> That's a, that is a great shot as well. I think... Uh, I might let Brody go because I think we might have the same one considering earlier you said we were going to come back to the funeral. No. Um, no? Oh. No, no. Yeah, I've got a completely different one. And it's the whole conversation scene um, with Frank and the mafia boss. Um, to me, <laughs> it's so fucking intense. I mean, you can hear a oh. pin drop in that scene. And it's the build up to that um, payoff, that final payoff we get, especially after the message. Uh, I think his name was Clay. Clay, uh, the mafia boss. Anyway, uh, uh, he was to give to Frank. So, you know, he was, uh, he knows about this message and he isn't fucking around. There's so many, um, that, I don't know, there's so many scenes in this film that I fucking love so much. And I've got to give a shout out to Lawrence Fishburne. Um, even when he's buying everything in the chicken store and, um, <laughs> and the, <laughs> it's so fucking great. Yeah, can I help you? Can you help me? Yeah, you can start by giving me 15 pieces of chicken, motherfucker. Mix it up, I'm gonna barbecue, I'm gonna crispy. You getting this all down, Chief? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want six pieces of corn, and I want, uh, you give me eight spare ribs, you give me, uh, 12 pieces of shrimp, uh, some onion rings. You want tartar sauce or ketchup on those, man? I want tartar sauce. You got any, uh, potato salad? No, we ain't got no potato salad. Look, get away from the games, all right? You ain't got no money, just get away from the games, all right? Yeah, I mean, like, 50 pieces of chicken, motherfucker. Yeah, I don't know. It's fucking great. And, and, <laughs> and the drug like, dealer the started. Chicken. <laughs> yeah. 30 seconds. The drug dealer at the start of the film is a fan-fucking-tastic um, opening that really had, had me hooked in. Um, look for the bullet holes, puto, and fucking bang, gone. Yeah, I don't know. So many iconic fucking scenes in this film, but I'd have to go with the mafia boss scene where Frank shoots the absolute shit through him. You know, uh, since we are talking about the way things are filmed and everything right now, uh, let's talk about all the nudity in this film was shot exceptionally well, primarily probably because of their porn experience. <laughs> Hmm. They, I mean, I would assume, right? <laughs> well, all the nudity. Well, well think get, about get it. it. Like nudity. <laughs> okay, this film. Okay, this podcast uh, started with Crash, so you saw how th nudity was filmed there. This was filmed almost with the. This was filmed with the same attention to detail in a, in a very stylish way, and I think that their previous work in the porn industry lended a hand to some of these awesome shots of the female body that we see in this film, especially the interior shot of uh, the train while they're making out in the train. Such yeah, good that one actually came really unexpected to me as well. <laughs> He's like, well, ride the train. I'm like, oh, they subverted it. No, they didn't. <laughs> it's like, oh, nope, it's there. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, even then, still like... Bang. Yeah. No, no, I know. And the nightclub yeah, yeah. gets some pretty cool shots of some dancing. Like, I just think it's, I don't know. I just think those stood out because I think they were well done. Like, sometimes it's done just sleazy, and I think that this is just done the proper way. It's more artful than it is sleazy. There you go. By long shot, I will say. And yeah, I'd say it's it's been done even better than, per, like, 
previous movies we've talked about in episodes already. Like it's probably one of the best. Out Nothing's of pre car crash boob flash, but this is this is, this is pretty. Oh, right. good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will. Oh, Nick, sorry. Um, I I don't think I actually finished my my favorite scene. Oh, um, because because I I thought Brody and I had agreed on it, but uh, uh, it was the the funeral. Um, it was Dennis's death was mine. Um, just because of kind of the subversion for it. Because while you're watching it, while he's there and he's at the funeral and this might be a bias for me because i've seen stuff like um law-abiding citizen um and things like those where it's like you, you at the funeral and you expect it to be safe to some degree you know especially because it's a cop's funeral there's cops everywhere and then he he runs off david caruso's character dennis runs off back to his car you know he's mad because he's a fucking idiot and he never should have done anything that he fucking did the entire <laughs> movie and his boss was telling him not to and he and wesley snipes character tommy just did and now tommy's dead i'm assuming he's blaming himself you know he's wrecked with emotions he's blaming frank and all of that and he's sitting he's punching the steering wheel in his car and all of that and the limo rolls past and i was almost just expecting because of where it was for frank to just go oh that's your fault or something i knew it was gonna be him but just the hey you and he looks up and his head's gone he just gets shotgun straight off his freaking butt i was like eh. and now this is my favorite part of the movie <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, i think that was just it, it even for as many any biases towards it as many similar films as I've watched I was still guessing the entire time watching it just for the payoff just to watch David Crusoe get his head blown off with a sawed off it was great I just loved it I loved every second of that scene um but yeah that was that was mine so okay so that will kind of answer your question for favorite death uh yeah yeah <laughs> a little bit i uh, like the uh the acting that went into lawrence fishburne's character's death and all of the scenes that led up to that i think that it was really well acted it was really well done yeah I mean, oh, second for me it was larry's the policeman that gets fucking taken out by a fire hydrant get off the fucking car ah, Oh, man, I know. <laughs> that one was brutal. The crush, the sound design on that one. <laughs> you his head, like his skull just connect. Man, it was, uh, oh, it was brutal. I had actually uh, the funeral death um, as my favorite at death because – the first time I ever saw that scene, I actually fucking jumped. And it was big, one of the biggest at the time, what the fuck moments in cinema history for me. And um, and when I think or hear of this film, my mind instinctively goes directly to that death scene every single fucking time. It's absolutely brutal and I love it. And it just goes Great. to show how incredibly dark Watkins' character is at this stage. He is going, fuck these guys. I don't care where they are. I will let you know how powerful I really am. And I am a force to be fucking reckoned with in this short time of my existence. I Seriously, love it's it. great. I, that scene is incredible. The fact that he's he literally rolled up to a police funeral to kill a cop in front of a bunch of other cops at a police funeral. Like, it's... It's insane. The man's like, got balls. Just gives, no, gives no fucks. The thing is with that scene is that he's he's like it's clever because yes, he get, does get around in a limo, but it just happens so that there's so many limos at this fucking grave site, and he just blends in so well. Like he doesn't even have to try and fucking blend in, you know. It's just exactly like, he's just casually got a limo. So I think it when yeah when I saw, saw that I'm like holy shit and. It was actually satisfying to see that dickhead get his head blown off because he is the douchebag in this movie, I find. Fucking asshole. Dennis's character is an asshole the whole movie. Even when he's trying to still be a good guy, he's still just a dick the whole time. And even, like, the fact that his boss was like, no, do not go fucking trying to shoot up Frank, you moron. You're going to take all of us down. You're going to take, like, this whole thing. I almost kind of feel bad for the police lieutenant or captain can't remember uh, frank's like major rival the one that he's talking to the guy that's in charge of the cops but like the fact that he was like no don't do that you moron you will get us all killed he don't fuck with them i almost feel bad that he had to like go and die as well because dennis just went i understand what you're saying cat but um i'm gonna go fuck with him <laughs> like, i have no sympathy to take him down exactly i like no real sympathy for dennis at all during that i like just kind of feel a little bit bad for the police 
captain his boss that gets killed which even then kind of his own fault <laughs> chasing him down into the subway letting him take a hostage then doing a draw i'm like you you were the worst cop <laughs> he knew what he was in for i did seriously thoughts on story boys criminally underrated criminally seriously underrated. i again just it really does to me it feels like a modern day al capone I, I i pretty much went over it all earlier i won't you know reiterate everything that i already said for the sake of not repeating myself but yeah i really do it feels like a modern day al capone 30 years ago modern day but still um it was good it was just it was a complex character it's how do you feel uh, about this person who is going against everything the law says, but they're doing it, as they say, for a good reason, remodeling this hotel, getting it up to speed for a neighborhood that desperately needs it. But in order to hospital. do so, their hotel. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I said hotel. I'm an idiot. Hospital. But yeah, uh, you know, it, this neighborhood that desperately needs it and all this. But in order to do so. They're selling drugs. They're killing people on mass, damn near. But like, and then even the good guys that are supposed to be taking him down are the bad guys. They just show up and just start murdering them outside of you know all of that. It's just no one's a good guy and no one's a bad guy. Welcome to New York, kind of. There's one scene in this film that sums it up perfectly, and it's when they're all the cops are sitting at the bar, and um, you know they break it down to the. They're the ones that are poor for doing good things and he's rich by doing bad things. It's pretty on much the whole story as it is, but they capture that realism perfectly in that scene and it sums the whole film up beautifully. That's what I like. But the thing is, Abel didn't really try and throw it in your face as well. Like he, he lets you, the audience, obviously flush it all out and elaborate on it as the film rolls on. But yeah, I just really like that scene and I just had to mention that as my thoughts on the story. It's that sums it up extremely well it is it's, it is a great one whenever he's standing there and he's going we make what forty forty thousand dollars a year to keep people like him off the streets and then he just walks back out a couple months later he's doing the same thing and he makes like 10 times what we do i un I understand why he was mad like i get it like yeah this film is a organized crime film like none other especially for the audience in the united states i think that this film came about at a time where a lot of this stuff was tough subjects especially especially race issues. And you can call this a racist film. I don't see that. Maybe some of the things are said, but it also shows the depravity of some of these people as well. Uh, I think that this film is extremely diverse and inclusive of all sorts and types of people. I think that uh, that is representative in a lot of Abel Ferrara's work. I love some of the mo of some of the more unique shots and stylish shots in this film. As for the aforementioned uh, stylish nudity shots and some of the uh, shots that actually have emotion and reasoning behind them, I think it's everything's really done well i think it's edited well i think it's put together well i love the flow i love how the attention to detail paid off in the long run in having such a loaded cast allowed for such unique characters to grow within this very unique script and i think that it's just so well done that nobody else could have made a, this type of film at this type of time and abel ferrara is really known for his neo-noir imagery and it is so so fucking prevalent in this film more so in his other work as well but i just love how he in, manages to encapsulate the feeling of new york the, the feeling of the people mm -hmm. that live in new york and the feeling of organized crime that is unique to you New York because there's more than just one organization there's more than one family it's a constant competition where your lifespan is short where violence the violence rate is high and it's it's just a fast-paced non-stop war and I think that a Bell Ferrara does it so well with this film that's all I can say oh, yeah. there's a special prop to the Chinatown shootout scene so cool so fucking oh, yeah. rad Oh, so good, man. That whole, and they just straight up just filmed that in an alley in Chinatown in New York. Guerrilla like, style just, filmmaking at its best. I, do, oh, I swear. It's almost like a, uh, it almost feels like a high production version of guerrilla style filming, right? It's just so good. I just love that whole scene with the, uh, the Chinese gang and just, especially after, oh, I should have mentioned this earlier. One of my favorite scenes was also whenever he was meeting with the Chinese gang leader in the theater when they're watching Nosferatu. Yes. And it's all smoky and everything. And he sends oh, his guy. Yeah. You're not going to save uh, Frankenstein? <laughs> yeah, he's like, I've got her. Yeah, and he, he sends him <laughs> off and he, a girl next to him, he brings her in. He goes, ah, don't worry. I got Frankenstein up next. <laughs> you tell Artie Clay to go fuck himself. That was it. Artie Clay. That was his name. Whenever you said Clay earlier, I was like, 
I think that's right, but I don't know if it's his first name. <laughs> Anything else before we get on to our final point, boys? Nothing for me, I don't think. I think I'm good. I'm pretty A-OK, Mr. Bowser. Okay, so impact and takeaways, boys. Nick? I, I mean, I can absolutely see the impact for this one. Um, this definitely, definitely bled, uh, I mean, into the other mafia films of the time. The 90s were a big time for, like, organized crime movies. Um, uh, cut of the chase for it. Goodfellas came out, what, one, two years after this? It had a, a much different approach, but at least for the action scenes, it feels very similar. 1993's, uh... Innocent Blood. It is a vampire organized crime film that takes place in Pittsburgh. I now need to watch that. <laughs> uh, there is cameos from Dario Argento and Ted Raimi. Why am I not watching that right now? And it um, features some of the Sopranos cast before the Sopranos. Stop. <laughs> I can only be so erect. You have to quit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I mean, I definitely see elements of this in subsequent organized crime films. Yes. Goodfellas, I've already named a few years after uh, 96, I believe, or 95, Casino um I, I don't know it's got maybe not as much like shot for shot feel but just overall tone of casino i, I feel is is roughly very similar it's just a lot darker i think they just kind of took it in a little bit of a different direction um Chris, casino was scorsese wasn't it as well yes okay so I thought um, he usually does kind of go in that direction a little bit more. He gets to be just a bit more brutal with it. Um, I definitely feel like this 100 percent influenced the the mafia movies and such that would come out at least in Absolutely. the subsequent years for the rest of the decade. There's no way I feel like subtract this movie from the equation. I feel like Goodfellas, Casino, um, an American gangster, things like that would not have felt or been shot the same that they were okay. um, whenever they did come out. So you believe that this set the tone for all other films that come after this? I really do. Okay. Honestly, I, and I know that this one was popular because I mean, even just before this, trying to figure out how to, pronounce abel's name he was on conan yeah and, and, and i mean that Big was a deal. couple years after this one but yeah like even conan was like a lieutenant a bad lieutenant and he, like he even mentioned it in the one king of new york a few years ago and all that like he, it was big it may not have been immediately successful like we said there was backlash and all that people didn't like the subject matter they didn't like the good guy or bad guy drug kingpin getting away with it technically at the end um or portraying him as a morally ambiguous gray area character but like it tell me that we watch Goodfellas and we see Henry Hill as not a morally gray, ambiguous character we're supposed to like, but he does horrible shit. And that movie came out like a year after. But yeah, that was uh, more or less my my impact and takeaway from it. What about, what about you, Brody? Yeah, um, it's definitely a uh, product of its time with themes, uh, especially we've already established in, well, like TJ spoke about before, um, all the themes and that in the previous question. But, you know, um, it's a film that definitely still holds up today. Um, I, I'm like you, Nick. I do think it's inspired a lot of uh, not only just crime films, but a lot of uh, dramatized uh, films around New York, that setting. Um, I also forgot to mention this in the show notes. Uh, he was in talks of making a prequel to this film. So, and apparently that would have probably, um, I think it was meant to basically be about Frank, but it was going to be a bit more controversial in the themes of like, on why he recruits, um, well, these black people for his crew. And, and yeah, I, I think if he was going to try and make that film today, it obviously wouldn't happen because yeah. Uh, but he also said, he goes, I don't think I would like to make it anyway. I think King of New York is basically its own film. We'll leave it at that. There you go. Yeah. But, yeah. I think that's a good choice for sure as a standalone just and media res out of prison but like before anything else good absolutely but yeah no i yeah i have nothing but love for this film uh the themes the undertone of it um it's it's fucking incredible and it's definitely i actually highly rate this more than like martin scorsese's casino i think this film is just fucking incredible and it set the foundation for all these past films um yeah past crime films as a scorsese fanboy i could honestly agree with you on that one i think i think goodfellas is better but i think this is yes. better than casino absolutely I and mean, that's a fucking great movie too don't get me wrong casino's fan Fantastic. It's one of my favorite movies ever. So I think that... <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Was this show not just me and Brody talking about Scorsese movies? For that? <laughs> oh, shit. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This was actually my introduction to Abel's work, and I have to say that I'm actually a fan now because of this film. I, Like I said, I, I did watch New Rose Hotel before the show, and that fe- featured the lovely Asia Argento, and I enjoyed that film as well, and we'll probably, uh, I hope, talk about that in a future season stay tuned for more on that but yeah i think he just has a very unique way of storytelling and like like rock and just re-say whatever you guys already said but like again you see the impact you can feel these tones just how you can see how it's replicated on a, in other films and in some way shape or form it's it's great but anyway boys let's rate this son of a bitch and we're gonna rate this nick um i'm gonna have to give it I'm going to go with a 4.25. The fact that it beat out Casino, in my mind at this point, is is insane, and I can't go any lower than that. I can't give it below a 4. Uh, 4.5. I'm going to give it a 4. And that is a Lights, Camera, Exploitation score of 4.25 out of 5. So, Ooh. Slick Nick, what's next episode? We're going to watch Shift! <laughs> 1971 that's right and we will be back at the same bat time at the same bat channel this i promise you yeah so stay tuned for more exciting episodes from us guys thank you for tuning in to another episode of lights camera exploitation and remember to head on over to projectlouder.net your source for pop culture and so much more and check out some of the other great podcasts over there and you can find them all on spotify itunes audible and anywhere else you listen to audio only content this is your host with the motherfucking most tj bowser signing off this is your doppelganger kang and banger all the way from fucking down under saying sayonara bitches <laughs> slick nick saying see ya next week boys and girls Start spreading the news I'm leaving today I want to be a part of it New York, New York These vagabond shoes Are longing to stray Right through the very heart of it A New Atop of the heat, these little town blues, they are melting away. I'll make a brand new start of it in old New York. If I can make it there. It's up to you, New York.